Welcome to Read Committed Snapshot and Snapshot Isolation Levels in SQL Server. I'm Kendra Little from SQLWorkbooks.com. In this session, we're going to talk about why do we need snapshot isolation and read committed snapshot isolation in SQL Server. These are also known as ways that we can use optimistic locking. We'll talk about what the difference is between these two isolation levels, and we'll do a quick demo of snapshot isolation in action, showing how it can solve problems and give you consistent, correct data where read committed can't do that. We'll also talk about different scenarios where you should enable optimistic locking and how to decide if you should enable read committed snapshot isolation, snapshot isolation, or perhaps both. So first up, why do we need these? Well, it's important to know that these features are still relevant. We got snapshot isolation and read committed snapshot isolation back in SQL Server 2005. And even if we look at Microsoft for a guide, they've been using these isolation levels in terms of building out new features and new product service offerings. So Azure SQL database, for example, it's a hosted database product where in the cloud, Microsoft can host the database for you. And in Azure SQL database, the default isolation level is read committed snapshot isolation. Microsoft wants that Azure SQL database to be as fast as possible. And often when you're using Azure SQL database, your little database may be on an instance that behind the scenes, there are other people using that instance. Microsoft doesn't want you having a lot of blocking on your instance and have a, a whole ton of blocked sessions that maybe are using up tons of threads. They want to reduce that blocking. And so they decided for many different reasons that it was better to change the default isolation level there. Also, the readable secondary feature in availability groups, it takes advantage of snapshot isolation to make reading that secondary possible and to try to help the performance of getting the data over to the secondary while people are reading it as good as possible. So just like Microsoft, these days when we're coming up with new applications and new features, it can be really useful to, to use these optimistic forms of locking instead of these older pessimistic isolation levels that you see on this slide. The isolation levels are here in the, the yellow portion of it. At the lower end of the spectrum, the lower level of protection or isolation, we have read uncommitted. Then we have read committed. And it is highlighted because by default, on most of our SQL Server instance, read committed is our default isolation level. If we aren't in Azure SQL database, if we aren't querying a readable secondary in an availability group, read committed typically is the default isolation level in SQL Server. We also can have higher forms of isolation. We can be even more pessimistic by using repeatable read or by using serializable. These are called pessimistic. And I think of pessimistic as I need to protect myself with locks. Even in read committed isolation level, we don't have the highest form of transaction isolation or protection, but we still, when we read data, we're going to lock it. And read committed uses short term locks. But while I'm reading data, I'm going to lock it to make sure that nobody else can modify it while I'm reading it. As I raise my isolation and go up to repeatable read, I, I say, oh, if I've already read the data, I want to make sure that if I need to go back and read that again, it's the same. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maintain locks after I read something. I'm not going to let go of those locks right away. So repeatable read. Also, I have to use locks when I'm reading, and I'm going to keep them after I read data. Serializable goes even farther. It says, I want to make sure that data can't be inserted, that not just the data that I've already read is protected, but I want to make sure that data can't be inserted in there, that no ghosts can happen. And it protects data using even a different kind of lock called the key range lock. So while I'm reading, I'm taking out a different kind of lock and I'm holding it for locker. So we're 
I'm holding it for longer. <laughs> so as my isolation level gets higher, my my level of pessimism gets higher too. Oh, I'm very pessimistic. I have to worry about the fact that some of this data may be updated. And I have to worry about the fact that some data may be inserted. Now, these are really valid things to worry about, it turns out. We do want to return the right data in SQL Server, but because being more protected, being more isolated requires holding locks for longer and, and holding sometimes locks on whole ranges of data, it's not very attractive to just raise your isolation level because we'll have even more blocking. Even in the read committed isolation, where we hold locks for short amount of times as we read the data, even there we can have performance problems because uh, somebody wants to modify the data, but somebody else is reading it and we have a big blocking chain that happens behind it. This leads to people lowering their isolation level with these traditional kinds of it and saying, oh, I want to use the minimum amount of locks I can. I'll use read uncommitted. But this means that the chances that we're already pretty good with read committed that I'm going to return wrong data sometime to my users without me knowing it. Wow, I'm definitely going <laughs> to, as long as data is being modified, I'm really going to start returning results that are questionable because I will even read data that is in the process of being modified. I don't even know if that modification is going to commit. So that can get really, really tricky. So in read committed, we do have some weird phenomena and weird phenomena means incorrect data going back to your users. It gets even worse if we go more uh, to the side of read uncommitted. So here's how read committed can return incorrect data. Read committed, one of the things that can easily happen under read committed is double counting a row. And this is because read committed holds locks for a short amount of time. So for example, we have an index here. This index is on first name and it contains a long list of first name. Since the leading index key is on the first name column, the index itself has the A's on one side of the index and the Z's on the other side of the index. It's ordered alphabetically. And we have a query that is counting the number of first names in this index. The query who's doing the counting is represented by the bird here. And notice that it's holding the lock in its mouth. That represents, as this, this bird runs the query, it's doing a scan of the index to count the names. As it moves across the rows, it's only locking the data that it's reading at the time. Let's say the engine has decided to take out page level locks in this case. It's locking the pages that it's reading and then it's letting go of them quickly. So right now we're counting those first names and we're in the middle of the index. We are not locking the data that we've already read. We're in read committed and we're just, we're, we're gonna make sure that we're reading committed data, but we're only worrying about the part of the data that we're currently reading. While we're in the middle of this table, while we're locking this row here, an update starts in a different session. And the update is correcting a name. We have a name that's A-A-B-A-N, and it's like, oh, there was a data entry error. That name is actually Z-Z-A-B-A-N. There are two Z's at the beginning of this name. That update physically moves the data in this disk-based row store index. This is an index keyed on first name and there's enough first names that they don't all fit on one page. And the A's are in a range of pages on one side of the index and the Z's are on in a range of pages on the other side of the index. So if we change a first name, that row is physically relocated in the index and that can happen very quickly because the query doing the update, it's able to very quickly say, oh, Here's the row I'm going to see here's the row I need to change there it is there's where I need to put it it doesn't have to scan the whole index to do this it's able to really quickly do that update it can finish that update before a query doing the scan ever completes so now our scan goes on and we have counted this name twice we counted it once when it was a a b a n we counted it a second time when it was z z a a b a n 
we have no idea that it's the same row because we were only locking the part of the data that we were reading and we were letting the locks go quickly because we're in read committed. We read this row twice. We will think there is an extra baby in this table that never existed. Similarly, we could miss the row entirely. Let's say we're running the same query, scanning the table, and we're scanning through the table. But while we're in the middle, an update starts. And it takes a baby whose name is ZZAABAN, and it updates it to AABAN. That's physically relocated in the table. Well, I already read the A's in the data, and that wasn't there. I just keep reading the table, and when I get to the Z's, that data is gone. So I have now seen one fewer baby than existed because read committed is only locking the rows that it's using. This can even happen in disk-based column store indexes if we're using the read committed isolation level and modifications are happening to the table where we have the column store index. And that's because the delta store on the column store index can have a similar scenario happen where we can count rows twice in the delta store or miss rows entirely. There's even more scenarios where we can get inconsistent results in a single query. And this is a, this is a big summing up of, of how this works, but the issue is basically that inside a query plan, we can have different branches of the query run at different times. So for example, with this hash match, the outer portion of the hash match goes first and it'll build up a hash table that's going to be used in a join. The second part of this, it's colored purple on this slide, it is going to run after the first phase completes. It's possible for the first phase to run and then for the second phase to be blocked by another transaction who's modifying data. So we've built part of our hash table and now we're waiting to read the other part of our hash join so that we can match up the rows. Well, the transaction who's modifying that, that part of the data we're blocked on, we have to wait for it to finish and it can modify all sorts of things, including in the same transaction, the part of the data we've already read. And this can lead to us getting really inconsistent results in SQL Server because we are going to read part of our data that was committed data before this other transaction finished, and then another part of our data that may contain committed data after that other transaction finished. And we can end up with really, really weird results. And that can be a huge problem.